701 actually I will call the November 9th 2015 school board meeting to order would you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all Okay, roll call, Mrs. Mayor. I'd be happy to. Tim Manneker. Here. Gary Dunlap. Here. Tom Cruise. Here. Jeff Young. Here. Cheryl Hancock. Here. Anita is excused. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. I'm here. And Lisa Collins. Here. Okay, so with six of the seven school board members present, I would declare a quorum. Um, board norms reflection. This may be the last time we do that and have that on our agenda as we are um, under consent agenda we have new operating principles or operating principles so um, moving on to approval of the agenda I would note that the agenda has been posted distributed and sent to the local media with this in mind are there any changes to the agenda at this time seeing none I would entertain a motion to approve the <coughs> agenda as published a move for a second a second discussion okay, seeing none all those in favor of approving the agenda as published please signify by saying aye aye, aye. Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Public participation. Is there anyone who wishes to address the board relative to any item at this time? We ask that a five minute time period per person be followed. Please come forward, state your name, address, and topic to be addressed. And I don't see anyone coming forward, so we will move on to recognition. And thank you, Dr. Mueller. All right, tonight we have a few of those. Um, first, um, Mr. Frawley donated a telescope. Um, in pristine condition um, and numerous accessories to our high school. So that will definitely help with our astronomy in our physics classes. So thank you very much. Um, Dr. Tronsted, she donated an Audi. The kids were pretty excited about that. Um, probably, I think that's so cool. Probably taking, you know, who gets to fix it and drive it. <laughs> um, uh, so for our high school technology education program, and then at Viking Elementary, we had quite a few staff members recently get grants. So, you know, in helping out with um, funding different opportunities for students, um, they've been working hard at that. Katie Curtis, a third grade teacher, um, received a Tools for Schools grant of $500 um, from WXOW TV. And then five other teachers um, received $100, the Mimic Foundation um, Book Fair grants to spend on scholastic books. Um, it was Katie Shepard in grade one. Ann Burkhalter, C, uh, Special Ed, Katie Curtis in Grade 3, Deanna Verdon at risk, and Kathy Burge. And then um, Angela Frankie at Grade 1 received a UWL Cooperating Teacher mini grant of $200 to purchase guided reading books um, for her classroom. So our students are really lucky to have these amazing teachers that um, go above and beyond to, do the, to make a, a difference for these students. Mm -hmm. And then, um, coming up, November 16th through the 20th is our American Education Week. Um, this was first introduced in December of 1921 um, by the National Education Association and American Legion. Um, it's, this week is designated um, to represent and presents all of Americans with a wonderful opportunity to celebrate public education and honor individuals who are making a difference in ensuring uh, that every child receives a quality education. So in the school district of Holman, we use this opportunity to celebrate not only our employees and all of our staff and all the wonderful things they're doing, but also for those who contribute to the ongoing um, success in, with our students in the community. So, you know, they have specific days. One day is, you know, celebrating parents and others, volunteers and community members and staff and so on. So we'll be there's lots of just special different events that have been planned within buildings to celebrate this. And we might have a little surprise ourselves. So, so thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I often talk about the uniqueness of Holman and those who um, support us inside and outside of the classroom. And you can see that 
um, tonight especially we have some people outside of the classroom or outside of the district some people who um, like um, Dr. Tronstead who is a part of the district who continues to give and um, our staff who go above and beyond um, and then it all kind of comes together in recognition of the excellence of all of our staff of the district um, <coughs> and your leadership so thank you for all that you do for our students and thank you to all the staff um, and stakeholders in the district for all that they do um, in and out of the classroom I would say so thank you very much then moving on to um, reports and discussion I think Beth Hobbs is up first for bus and van purchase Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. <laughs> I put an issue paper for a new special ed school bus that I would like to purchase. It is within my budget already. It's $100,925. It will be a four spot wheelchair, which is the biggest you can buy and still have seats on the bus. We could have all wheelchairs if we wanted to, but then you don't have the kids getting to uh, ride with the other kids when they go on field trips and on routes, etc. We right now have 14 students in our district in wheelchairs that we transport, so we have um, multiple varieties of what age level they're at. So this is a replacement bus. It will replace a uh, 92 bus that we would like to take out of commission, so. Any questions? Any questions? No questions, but just a great appreciation as a citizen of how much it costs, but how much it's worth it. To do Just this. thinking, maybe I should donate a bus to the high school. Do they want to work on a diesel bus? Or <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, no, I just appreciate the whole bid process and going through that. And I know that your brain wraps itself around what's best for our kids in the district. And even for you to say something like, um, we need a bus that can take wheelchairs, but have regular ed kids too on a field trip, I find that incredible and so important because they're leaders for different reasons so thank you for all that work they have great opportunities they get to go lots and lots of places yep um i think yeah. tim had a question oh, go ahead, tim. how many buses now do we have that are wheelchair compatible i have five six six Th this bus is how big how big? I mean, how many it, students? How many students can It'll you? hold 65 total and then the four wheelchairs. Oh, okay. Uh, I thought it was, um, I was just curious. He said it was the one that's retiring is from 1992. Is probably not, but does technology change? Has it gotten any better with more buses? Oh, and, yeah. It, especially with the emissions, and they do a lot more stuff so you don't have the diesel coming out the back. It's all, okay. they say you can take a white handkerchief and put it on the exhaust pipe, and there's no. <laughs> It oh, will really? not leave anything on the handkerchiefs. So. Do the seats all have the uh, like the trucker seats, so you don't they all bounce back and forth? <laughs> the driver's seat does. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw the, a thing on TV today that some legislation may happen federally. It looked like um, w related to seat belts, and I know that's kind of a subject, but yeah, that hopefully, again, yeah. hopefully, if that comes down, that will come with some dollars if we have to retrofit. <clears throat> but. What I'm afraid of is it will cause us to have to buy more buses because we won't be able to put as many students on a bus that we do now. I know I watch our neighbor is in a wheelchair and so I watch um, every day and the care and you know that student has an aid with them so um, yeah it's always remarkable to see and it is a regular ed I think regular ed students also. It's a nice service I mean yeah. it's definitely because I, my son's one of his best friends had one, he used to right by our house, and the, the lift would come down, and it was, yeah. there. she was always glad to get on, so it was comfortable. Okay, okay, and that will be on the next agenda, I think, for approval. Right. So if there are any questions in between now and the next meeting, please um, forward them to Dr. Mueller. Thank you. I was told, uh, I only got two bidders, because our third bidder told me they couldn't get the bus to us before July 1, because they are so, Backlogged, and he suggests that we maybe start looking in more in the summer to bid buses so that we don't, so that we can get our bid. Uh, okay. Okay. No, thank, thank you. you. <coughs> and then youth options report. Basky. Oh, 
Do I have to use the microphone? Yes, it's, okay. it's actually for the public. Okay. Broadcast. All right. Yeah. Uh, well, good evening. Uh, thanks for uh, letting me attend. Um, I'm Tim Bakeberg. I'm. I wear a number of different hats within the district now. Uh, one of those I have the privilege of wearing the hat for is youth options. Uh, so tonight, uh, here to do a, a number of items. Uh, one, uh, seeking approval for our youth option candidates for this school year. But um, if you have questions about what youth options is um, or how the whole process works, um, I've been fortunate enough to get a crash course introduction myself on the whole youth options process. So I, I have a handout for you, more just for, for your own viewing. Uh, we're not gonna go through that whole thing. Um, look at it as you may. Uh, some of it is district policy. Uh, on the first page, it's policy from the post-secondary institutions that we work with for youth options, uh, what they're looking for from our students. Um, so the youth options process, um, first of all, what it is, um, it allows our Holman High School students the opportunity to participate at various post-secondary institutions. Uh, by law, uh, that would be any uh, state school uh, and many, many of the private schools as well. Uh, for Holman High School students, that really comes down to three schools uh, within our close proximity, UWL, Viterbo, and Western Technical College. Um, students qualify for the program, and once they qualify for the program, they receive both college credit, so they'll have a, a college transcript with college credit grades on there and a GPA, and we also give them post, or we give them high school credit as well, and it's a .25 to a one ratio. So if they do three credits at, at Western, that would be .75 credit at Holman High School. Uh, does not affect their GPA. Um, it comes in as an elective credit. Um, so it, it kind of balances out those students that are advancing on taking rigorous courses uh, but still allows them the opportunity to do that. Uh, the, the main thing uh, that students struggle with and parents as well, and, and we try to get the word out, is that that application deadline, this again is, is set by state law, is March 1st for fall semester and October 1st for spring semester. Um, so by March 1st and October 1st, I assemble a big list of students um, and they complete the start of a, a long process, it seems like, for students um, to get the approval. Uh, and the way that process works very quickly, um, school counselors like myself and the other three at the high school will meet one-on-one -on -one with those students. Uh, sometimes that's during a junior parent meeting, sometimes it's uh, during the school year around registration time, and, and we see if it's a good fit for them. Um, we wanna make sure students are well aware of what this all entails. They are getting college credit. It's the start of their college career. Um, and it has to fit into their career plan. So we ask, what's your career uh, and does that fit? Um, they have to have extinguished all high school coursework in the area. Um, we have a lot of nursing assistant students that you'll see in, a, in the next slide. Um, we don't have that course offered here currently at the high school. So obviously that is one that we would like to offer our students at some of the other institutions. Um, and then, th of course, they have to meet college, university requirements and prereqs. Um, so on that front page, you can see juniors and seniors only. Um, it's, not, it's not offered to sophomores or freshmen, and they have to be um, stellar students um, by far in order to even qualify for the program. Once we know that they have qualified, uh, they fill out two application forms, turn it in to myself, uh, Mr. Bear will sign off on them, um, and then I present it tonight uh, for, for your approval. And then from there, I will meet back with the students. Uh, we'll finish up the application process. Uh, certain programs require lots of paperwork. Uh, healthcare, for example, uh, there's about another three or four forms that they need to fill out, background checks and things like that. Um, I mail that all off to the schools. Um, and then from there, it's really hands off from our standpoint, um, and they are now a college student in the admissions office will connect with them through uh, uh, email, through snail mail as I call it, um, and they'll start working with them. Uh, they'll register those students and they are um, college students. Um, so that's kind of the process. Um, as far as who we're looking at, uh, current students for fall 
2015, and then the, the next group coming in for spring of 2016. If you look at the slide, uh, Western is by far the most popular college that they attend, uh, 16 in the fall, 25 in the spring. Uh, UWL and Viterbo each have a few. Um, I put down the number of credits, and these are credits that they are hoping to apply for. There's a lot of ifs in this process. Um, they fall into the registration process at the bottom, which means all other students with more credits will get to sign up for those classes first. They kind of get what's left. Um, and then, of course, it has to fit into their high school schedule as well. So when you look at 87 credits from Western for spring, um, most likely it's not going to be 87 credits uh, that those students are going to be taking. I did look at last year, and I think it was about an 80% success rate from what they applied for and what they actually took, which is good. Um, if you look at courses, it runs the gamut. Um, but I wanted to point out the nursing assistant. Um, to me, I found that interesting. I don't know what that means exactly, but uh, we're looking at 23 students this year alone that are taking that nursing assistant program. Um, so our Holman High School students have a high interest in the healthcare fields at this mm -hmm. point. Um, and it's, it's great that they can go off and get their CNA while still in high school. Um, with that, um, are there any questions that I can answer? Yes. Is there a limit to how many students we could fund for this? Is there a cap on that as far as dollar amount? Or? Uh, no, not that I'm aware of. It's, it's state mandated that students can take the youth options, and if they meet the criteria, um, okay. they can take it. Yes? Do you have any history on the success after they're in college? Do you talk to them after they've been in college and how it's helped them or where you can improve upon your service? Um, well, since I am brand new, um, not yet, um, but that would be definitely, I mean, something that I want to look at to make sure, and I'm trying to streamline the process um, as I'm going through, uh, redid the paperwork, uh, trying to get that communication out to parents a little more efficiently um, so that they can be more successful and more students can become aware of those opportunities for them. Yeah, I think that's really important on any program we do in these schools is to have surveys and how well they work and, and right. get feedback because we need to have a constant, a continuous learning curve of improvement. So, good job. Thanks. Thanks. Other questions? Um, yeah, on a slide back, um, just, ha just a clarification, the second kind of bullet fits into the student's career plan. So, are these kids that at 17 or 18 they've already decided what they're going to be and they have chosen a career and is that the only ones this is open to or if you're not sure what you want your career to be which we know many high school students don't know yet no, do they have opportunities sure no great great question um, I just came from the junior parent meeting and that was one of our questions to the juniors next year seniors how many are know what they want to do once they graduate. And I, I think in a crowd of 300, we had a half dozen hands. Um, so we're, I mean, we're being realistic here. When we talk about career plans, we're looking very broad. Are you looking at attending a two-year school, attending a four-year college? And if you are, we look at the very basic gen eds that they need or liberal arts credits that they need. Or in the case of nursing assistant, it may be a course that's very program specific. And welcome, Tim. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and Tim, did you have a question? Yeah, just a, a quick question. Is that I'm reading this handout under the transportation, and maybe I'm reading this too literally. Uh, it says transportation to and from the post-secondary institution will be furnished by parents, guardians of eligible students. Does that mean the students are not eligible to drive themselves to and from? No, I. I, I that would be not quite right. So students can definitely provide their own transportation. Because that's it's, what I had thought. I just, yes. the way I was reading this, it says parents and guardians of eligible students. So I was just, thought maybe I was reading it too literally. <laughs> yeah, and, and on a side note to that, I mean, students that um, have free and reduced lunch um, or have a struggle providing the transportation, uh, the state does provide uh, reimbursement for transportation, which they can fill out the paperwork and um, help them get to and from school. So, 
I'm just I, I suppose the parent providing the transportation, it's still, if they're not an adult student, then the parent still is responsible for yes. it. Yes, they drive consenting and, to yeah. them, right. a form of that. So. Right. And another question, did you have a question, I, I think I might have answered it, but uh, this, this started in 1997, this program? Or when did Holman start doing it? I think the first year that it was mandated. Oh, oh so. it's mandated, okay. Yeah. Yep, it was mandated and, okay. you know, there were some concerns, I think, at first, obviously, the cost, but what we do, um, because this Holman pays the tuition, okay. the school district pays the tuition, so I think as we look at some programs, some coursework, some classes, it is more uh, feasible for us to have them do youth options than for us to be providing that course here for one or two oh, students sure. to bring a, an instructor in and, and that kind of thing. So we keep, we continue to look at that as a, um, a possibility. And you know, the nurse um, CNAs, you know, the, there are other options out there. I don't know if we've ever investigated that on mm -hmm. what might be a less sure. um, expensive way to provide that for our students. But I would bet the vast majority of them take that for work. If working in a nursing home, they have to have that. Right. Yeah, and it's, it's the first step uh, for any nursing program. It's a, it's a requirement to enter into a nursing program is to have that CNA taken care of, so. And you know, isn't it amazing that that one student at UWL with 10 credits, I mean, if they'd started even as a junior to do that, to go into college with the high cost of college, of that's very, very wise of those young people to be doing that. And some of those students there are gifted and talented. They've accelerated uh, through their senior year. They have that opportunity to, to take some higher level, uh, more rigorous <coughs> coursework. So I think if they go to the college for these classes too, it might uh, just change their mindset a little bit too. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a different environment. That's mm -hmm. good for them too, I think. Right. I think it's always about outside of the box. So us providing education for them doesn't necessarily mean it has to happen in that building. It can happen outside and what's in the best interest of those students. Well, I think there was, I think it was on one of these pages when I was reading the information today that students must, is it, I don't know if prove is the right word, that there isn't anything in district that can give them this opportunity. Mm -hmm. right. So these are kids who are looking at whatever we can afford to offer and do offer, but they just need more. Right. Oftentimes, it, maybe in the sciences and those types of things, we have maximized our what we can offer. And so calculus too, they might take that at the university and it just we just don't have the student body to <coughs> numbers to offer that here. So. There was, some course, do you have a list of the courses again? Can you go back? Because I learned a new vocabulary word today. I had to look up phlebotomy. phlebotomy. <laughs> I, I thought that sounds like a brain operation, blood. but I was pretty sure that's not what it was. Blood, blood. And then it's like, it's drawing blood. So I, I did. <laughs> So I thank you for your presentation oh, because you're, you're most it's welcome. my word of the day. There you go. <laughs> Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Thanks. It's inf information that's good for us to have. We appreciate it. So good to see you, Tim. And Thanks. Your first you presentation. Too. Thank you. Okay. Then auditor's management letter. Do we hold on? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Hi. On September 14th, um, we shared with you the um, audit and the management letter from the auditor for the 1415 audit. And I'm um, back here tonight just to share with you our response to their observations. Um, I'll just go through the observations quickly and then the response. And this is all in the issue paper as well. I just wanted to provide a little more detail. Um, the first item that they um, were recommending an improvement in process on is the cash handling procedures. They looked at the middle school. Um, remember, the audit always does a sampling, and so the middle school was selected for this process this year. And um, they've identified, according to their observation, not all customers received a cash receipt copy. Um, there's some concern about um, students paying fees to teachers and the record keeping. 
um, before it gets to the office for a deposit. And then also um, a potential concern with segregation of duties when that money is handled in the school site office. Um, so I have met with um, Joni and Ryan at the middle school and we went through their procedures just so that I could also learn it since I'm still kind of new here. Um, and we've identified that the teachers do keep a record. It just wasn't provided with the deposit to the office, so when the auditor was looking at those receipts, they didn't have the supporting documentation. So that's one of the resolutions to that concern is to have all of those deposits turned in with the list. Mm -hmm. um, we've also identified that um, the list needs to include the student's name and the type of payment, check or cash, and the amount so that it can easily be reconciled for refunding of students or parents. And again, since this is a sampling in the middle school, we will be extending the new procedures out to all sites just to make sure that we're compliant and can pass that audit observation next year um, for different sites that may be selected for that review. Um, secondly, the district um, needs to track personal property tar uh, tax chargebacks. We receive our levy receipts um, from the municipalities in full according to what we levy and then if they are not able to collect from taxpayers, we get a, a bill and we have to reimburse the municip municipality. The auditor wants to see us um, tracking that so if those delinquent uh, taxpayers ever do pay the municipality and we get our, our money, we um, can cross it off the list or, or check it off because we know that we've received that. Um, later in the future. Um, so we've developed a process to start tracking um, those delinquent payments so that we can keep track and reconcile. And lastly, um, old outstanding items. Um, in the past, um, it's my understanding that things were voided if they were really old or they just kept going outstanding on the bank reconciliation. Um, so the business office has developed a process to um, follow the state requirements for um, submitting to unclaimed property according to the Wisconsin guidelines. In our first year, we are just trying to clear those checks by contacting individuals, which is part of the state process, um, and giving them an opportunity, if we can contact them at their last known address, to request a reissued check. Um, and so we're working through the process. Next year, we will follow the guideline for submission November 1st to um, Wisconsin Unclaimed Property. We are required to give um, people, I think it's 120 days notice. So basically, at the very end of the fiscal year, we have to send the notice that there is an, uh, an outstanding check and give them um, several months to reply before we turn it over to unclaimed property. So to meet those guidelines, we need to implement, implement that beginning in 2016. But again, we're working on re resolving those so we have less letters to send out next summer. Yeah. Any questions? Any questions? Thank you very much for your hard work on Thank that. Thank you. Ben. Consent agenda items. We have a number of items tonight to be considered. Are there any that you would like to um, have pulled out separately? Have considered separately? I have two I'd like to have pulled out for tonight. 10.6A, uh, uh, the employee handbook language revisions, and then 10.8B, uh, first reading of the acceptable use policy. 10.8B. Any others? Okay, so then I would entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda items with the exception of 10.6A and 10.8B. I so move. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Uh, you wanna make any comments, yeah. Chris, under? Yeah, personnel? on the personnel report, I just wanted to congratulate um, Sandy Fisher is um, retiring and she's been with our district for 31 years. Um, she's a head custodian at Evergreen. And um, what I've learned also is um, quite a few of her family has helped us out also mm -hmm. in the district and does that. So we just wanna thank her for all of her efforts and time and dedication to our district. So. Okay, thank you. So a motion has been made and seconded to approve the consent agenda items with the exception of item 10.6A and 10.8B. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. 
Motion carries. Then item 10.6A is um, the employee handbook language related to CPR, first aid, AED. Um, I guess the first step appropriately would be to see if there is a motion to approve this language. This is the first, uh, well, I guess this is employee handbook language, so there's only one reading. But if there is a motion to approve this language. So moved. Is there a second? Second. And then discussion. Any discussion on this, Tim? Well, I think the reason why I asked it to be pulled is, you know, from the last meeting, I think there were some concerns that this appeared to be more of a cost savings benefit. Um, and that to me is, is probably not a good reason to limit the number of people with this training. And then now with uh, potentially some of the changes at the state requiring that middle schoolers now be fully trained in this to uh, cut back the number of staff um, I think would would be of some concern at this time and um, would would I think it should be more encompassing and, and really include um, you know more and it seems like we're going the opposite way and having less and I mean I can speak some unless sure. you want to go no. first you know, when we were looking at this um, employee handbook language, there was kind of, two, I guess, maybe two parts to it. One is we wanted to make sure we always had someone that had the training. that So we always looked at kind of location. So we always have people available. And then we wanted to make sure we had our crisis response teams in the schools in place and so on. But then we also talked about outside of the school setting, we want to make sure we have um, people who are certified always on a field trip and so on. So there's always someone there that would need to respond. Now when it comes to quantity, um, I guess if you had a crisis of some sort and you had more than one person needing CPR, you'd need multiple people on the scene to do that um, piece. Um, and another part of the conversation we had is a lot of times, um, you know, if you're in a rural school district and you don't, the response time for your EMT is lengthy versus in Holman, our response time is pretty quick um, if we needed that response also, is kind of some of the discussion that we had with that part of the policy, or with the handbook language, I should say. I understand Sorry. now all yeah. teachers are required currently to have that under the current. Under the current yeah. language, all, yeah. staff. all staff. All staff are required. Are required. Okay. Is there anyone else before Tim speaks again? I'm not sure, and I'm just, and I don't want to do all the talking here, and I, I, I'm just thinking out loud if, I'm trying to decide and I'm just speaking out loud, and I probably shouldn't do that, if I want to make an amendment to add all staff or if I, would just vote no to have it go back to the employee group because I really respect the work that they do and I don't want to take away from that. But I think I might just say that I'd, I'd like to amend the motion to have it refer again to all staff. To amend the motion to? Or make an amendment to add all staff to the employee handbook. To require all staff. To require all staff, okay. yes. Okay. All and staff I think that's certain. what it's eliminating. Is yes. All. So you're basically saying putting it back to. That's kind of where I'm trying to go. You know, that's a, a like a double jeopardy. Because <laughs> if you do that, if you don't want the teachers to, uh, all the teachers to be certified, you'd vote no. And then this, this would be defeated, so you can't have a double. So if you want <laughs> all staff to be certified, you could just vote no. Okay. Correct. And that, that would accomplish that. Then I will withdraw my amendment. Okay. And there wasn't a second. Thank you. Yes, but just there to was clarify. Not. So anybody else? I'm going to vote against this. Um, it came through my committee and came up through the ranks. But I, you know, when we studied it and I watched, I was unable to be here last meeting, but when we, I watched the discussion, and I think people brought some really good points up for discussion, but I, what I heard was more probably a little bit uncomfortable is part of it was cost savings. Part of it was a different way of looking. And the one, re, one thing I could support it for is the establishment of those 
crisis response teams because of that, and that came up as part of the discussion. But one of the things I heard was that, well, it was a policy that was on the books that just wasn't being enforced. And that kind of troubled me a little bit to hear that. I just went, so I, you know, there's a lot of reasons to do this. I think the legislature is talking about um, having our middle school students be certified or get training in that they don't necessarily have to be certified and I was a proponent of this long before I worked for an organization that um, did the training or does the training there are different ways to do the training than the way that we're doing it now that could be cost saving that might take a little bit of extra work but I'm just saying that I'm you know and I you know encourage people to vote there the way that they would like to vote and whatever happens happens Kate when when legislation comes down one way or the other we'll have to change our policy right no 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 if they require students Explain to that. be if they require okay. middle school students to be to receive that it doesn't still doesn't say all of our staff has to have that training but they're saying that students should be trained in CPR and first aid okay. we are a, a, more strict, more stringent than other districts. Um, but there are other districts in the area that require all staff to have this training. Can you, and, and then one last question, can you talk just a little bit about what you said? So we have a policy already, but it's not? Oh. Well, it's very, it's, it's very difficult to enforce because you hire someone, they have the training when they come in, but then to track 300, well, it's 300 and, some just HEA members, but you talk about, is it 600, 600 and some employees staff mem employees to tracking. try to track that whether they are certified or not. And I sat in negotiations where that employee group, so as we hear about the employee groups, they did not want their employee group to be, have to have that training. So I know there's a little discomfort. It is uncomfortable for some people to, to have to respond in this, you know, in that kind of manner. And so they felt that it was a waste for the district to train them that they had to go sit at, you know, at that training when they knew in their heart they wouldn't have been able to, be able to deliver that anyway. But and and I think part of it too is just with all the other mandates that have come down from the state level, just time. Like when do we find time to train 600 employees on CPR when we have to train them on a new assessment and we have to train them on educator effectiveness and and we only have so much professional development built within our calendar so then we're asking them okay on your own time now we want you to come in to have training on this everybody so I think part of the reasoning behind it is okay how can we still be as effective but be efficient in the process to make sure our service is still there for our students and staff but yet be reasonable with it and I think that's kind of part of where that conversation came from too so, so it, is this not a reasonable thing at this point is that kind of where that's, opinion. that's your that's opinion no, no, it's a question. I said, <laughs> is it not reasonable? You know, is I, that kind of It certainly is reasonable. This I think what the plan that they've put out there is reasonable, certainly. It is reasonable. Absolutely. Okay. Can I ask, yeah. so the feedback, staff, the majority of staff were saying that they felt... That no, I wouldn't say the majority of staff. Just as a staff group that I worked with were uncomfortable with it. What are other people. staff saying? To learn CPR, Education. they're uncomfortable? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, what were other staff saying? Like, do they think it was? Re do they think everyone had to be trained in this? Was it necessary? So, from what I heard, and, and I was going to say, it blank. went through the employee relations group, and it did move forward. So that group is representative of all of the employee groups, and it did move forward as it's written. So, the addition of something. So, so they were supportive of it. Of the change. Of the change okay. in that. In supportive of the change. Yeah. Gotcha. You always download a BG song on our mm. iPods. Right? <laughs> well, that's I just think, um, you know, and being in, I think it's part of the educator group, and being an educator, they, you know, you have so many responsibilities yeah. and requirements, and um, this is important, definitely, because it can save a life, but if we can have coverage of that and accomplish that without having another requirement based upon that, I think is 
where the conversation came about. Because with our crisis team in place now, and with um, saying these are the individuals that need to still have the training so that we're covering all of our grounds and locations um, was kind of the reasoning behind that. Because, you know, tracking six, over 600 employees, making sure they have their CPR training every, was it three years? I'm not sure how often they have to recertify. Annually CPR. Ooh. Annually. So every year. I, I mean, I'm not sure. But, I mean, it's, you know, it's time-wise, it can be very logistically, you know, a nightmare. But we never, we never want to um, put the safety of our children or staff against, you know, oh, it costs extra money. No. We want to still make sure we're providing that service, but can we go about it? in a different manner and still provide that service is kind of. Can I ask another question? So for people on these safety teams or what have you, could, could others also elect to take the training? Like could we keep it open oh, yes. to those people that if in this area it might make more sense to have more people than just the, the team people? And that was one of the, the things that had, wasn't part of the original, and we talked about it and said, yes, that the school district wouldn't necessarily pay for their time to get that training, but it would pay for their certification. Mm -hmm. So that, that is possible if you don't fall under one of those categories of being mm -hmm. you know, required to get it and you still are interested in keeping up your certification, um, you, will, you, know, you will be reimbursed for that. So, I guess I'm just nervous about who's determining what's enough to be where. I don't think where. there's any categories. Well, it, you know what I mean? Like who, how, how based on the building, based on the location, based on the, how do we know what's enough coverage? Well, I don't know if we no. thought, you know, with the high school with the wings, if we thought about is right. each wing fairly represented, but I think when they're looking at their crisis response team, they're talking about those kind of things. So I would suspect to, that they would make sure that each wing or each area would be represented by someone who could quickly come. Ask the question, uh, Mr. Bear. Since you've been principal, how many times in the high school can you think of where it uh, was required to administer CPR? Myself. No, not yourself. In, in, <laughs> in the school, as far as you know, in, in the school. Middle school? I remember that. Mm -hmm. And I know someone in this building received CPR, Rick Johnson. And yeah. But the, the point I'm trying to make is if you ask that question, if you have if you have someone in the within thirty feet of, of every student in the school right. and you have you have one incident every five years. I mean, seriously, you have to have every teacher in the district trained. Well, if it's your one, one, uh, your family member that one time. So Peter Warpel from Alaska. Even if with this plan, is, is, there, is there an opportunity for a student to, to go down and require CPR and there's no one available in the area? Well, we could get into a discussion. It's really the timeliness of that response and the immediacy of that response. So, um, but as I said to Kate's, I think it's reasonable. I think the plan is reasonable. It's just, and, but I'm still going to hold <laughs> So, any other discussion on that? Otherwise, there's a motion has been made and seconded to approve item 10.6A, um, change in the employee handbook language. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, aye. nay? Nay. Nay. And the motion passes. So um, next item is item 10.8B, acceptable use policy. I would entertain a motion to approve item 10.8B. I would so approve. Is there a second? Second. 
and discussion. I think the, 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 the principal reason, and, and probably say there are different ways to go about this, that I asked for this to be held out, is every time another policy, and even the other ones that came before us tonight, would always clearly identify what items were changing, either through a strikeout or a highlighting or some type of information, whereas this policy that before us is different than all of those and it doesn't clearly identify those areas that are changing. So as we go through it, I, I don't think it's very clear. So I'm not necessarily saying that I'm opposed to this policy. I'm just would like maybe the opportunity to have it brought back in two weeks when we had an ident opportunity to maybe have it more in line with the other policy changes that come to us that's clearly identified mm -hmm. what has changed, what has been struck and out, what's been added because all the other policies tend to do that as well. Now, maybe I've missed something, maybe <coughs> nothing's been changed on this. I doubt that that is the case, um, but it just, it, it appeared to be a little bit different. So I wanna be very clear that I'm not opposed to it. I just asked for it to be out because it was different than everything else we normally see. Dr. Mueller? Yeah. <laughs> In oh. addition to um, the group to sign the policies to go through them and make the changes, make the sign them, you want all the policies that come before the board to go through each one of them and show. Well, they all do. The other usually ones all do that. Usually they have the strikeouts or the highlights. They, they almost always do. And the other ones that are before us tonight either have new words bolded in yellow or what was taken yeah. stricken out. And right. they, they usually <coughs> so, come before us that way. And, yeah. and the others that do tonight, too. So, okay. it, so what happened? Um, <laughs> this policy has been going through so many revisions and strike throughs for um, of quite a few months that there were so many that um, we actually had received both the one with the strike throughs and they had a clean copy just so people could read it. So this is probably, um, I'll take the responsibility for the error um, as to why you aren't seeing the one with the strike through. So we have that and we can definitely get that into the drop box for you to review. So I apologize for that. So, and this is um, related to the use of the one-on-one, -on -one, correct? Yeah, we, the acceptable we, use policy. So we aren't able to, have we given the so students the one-on-one? What, -on -one? what we're doing is um, we have taken this draft and put it, um, we're sharing this draft um, as we're moving along as a draft um, and sharing with parents that um, this is something that we've been working on so that it does, because we did need to make changes and quite a few to match the changing um, days with technology and so forth. Um, and sh so we're sharing this, but then having the conversation with parents as to when this does get finally finalized, they will get a fresh copy notification of that so that they know exactly what that is. Because of the the one on one rollout, is there a time sensitive nature to the board taking action tonight on this that would cause issues at the middle school? No, I we've that I we're as able long to, as the board is okay with yeah. them sharing this draft. I think we're probably yeah. okay. So I mean, because I don't want to do okay anything that's going to create troubles. That was no. the purpose of my question. There is, I don't want to no. to upset that. So a motion has been made and seconded. Um, we are doing discussion. If you want it to be approved as it is, we can still. First reading. Still, right? It's the first reading. We could still do that. That's right. Thank you um, for pointing that out. This um, requires a second. It reading. requires a second reading because mm -hmm. it's policy. Mm -hmm. And so, in the time being, if you would provide us with the mm -hmm. cross out one, we yeah. could then could be voted down at the next meeting because mm -hmm. of those changes. And, but. and I am comfortable with that. Okay. Like I said, it wasn't that I was opposed to the right. policy. It yes. just was, it was structured so differently than the rest. I just, I kind of wanted to talk it through. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no problem. Good. So. Good. so a motion has been made and um, seconded to accept item 10.8B in the consent agenda. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. And we will, yes, if you want to, uh, why don't you provide that in the weekly update then so we have a little bit more time also to compare. Um, okay. Then, moving on to board member reports and discussions. Um, I'll call on board members in order. Roll call and you can share with us any 
committee reports or any comments that you have? Um, Tim Menninger. Uh, real just quick this evening, uh, Buildings and Grounds Committee met earlier this evening, uh, just had a kind of a, a, a brief continued discussion on prioritization of unfat, un, unmet um, items that are going on. It seems to kind of take the, the bulk of the time and it seems like those unmet things always do, but uh, good discussion and looking at maybe changing some of the rubrics as well to help with some of those decisions. So cool. it was uh, a good meeting we had earlier today. Gary? Gary Dunlap? <laughs> <laughs> it's quite a few yet. <laughs> I think the winter sports are already starting. Just yeah. this evening. <laughs> yeah. The winter sports started. Yeah, it was really busy. I have uh, nothing tonight. Nothing tonight? Um, Tom Cruise. Yeah, I wanted to thank Tim for bringing up the, these two policies, um, especially 10 point B, which I, I, I peruse these things that I didn't. I didn't even pick up what he picked up on as far as uh, some of the strikeouts and that sort of thing. I've been, I asked before about a, any kind of uh, a survey the, the school has done with students leaving and I, I was curious if we could somehow get some of that information sometime as far as what, how we do as a, as a school district, if we had feedback from the graduating seniors and their parents and how, you know, how our product matches up, you know, where can we improve upon? That's a far-reaching goal we should always be striving for. And I know I also asked about a study that Dale had presented about starting um, early start times and the, and the detrimental effects on the, I've always been kind of a big proponent on that. I understand we can't get up the crack at noon, and I don't expect that, but I, there's lots of evidence out there and I remember when Dale presented that I hit the nail on the head that we start too early but I also understand this is a slow moving ship and it's not easy to just change everything and I don't expect that and I underline that with the fact that um, when you have the state dictating policy to us that um, if we only had 38 hours in a day it wouldn't be a problem half the time so that's kind of a rambling thought so I want to kind of give credence to so what we do here, because we every teacher I've ever met is always very dedicated, but we should be malleable and we should be changing our policies, I think, to be as student-centric as possible. And I honestly don't know 100% of the time if we are. Any thoughts on that? Can we do a survey? Is, is that the student learning committee? Is that something we can throw together and get some questions out there and present it to the, to the populace? Well, I think First, I think there is a survey. Is there something done in their first year after they have graduated, Mr. Bayer, of alumni or graduating students? I think there was in the past, but recently we have not done that. And I think the practical case also is why they have to do that. Okay. And then um, the other item, the early start time item. I think, did you see the information in this week's packet, the weekly summary? I know that they provided information and background that had been provided about a year ago or a little bit over a year ago re related to that when the study had been done. I had done. not, I apologize. So yeah, so take a look at that, Tom. And then, right. um, I, you know, Dr. Mueller suggested and in, in, in check your email for me. Yeah, in her um, weekly comments that maybe this is something it just kind of rises to the top and I've said this as a board, we see articles, we like to bring these things to the attention of, you know, the administration. Um, everybody kind of has their thing, you know, Tim is year round school and <laughs> daylight savings time and I'm picking know. up on them all. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and so we all kind of have our I've only own. I've been saying that for nine that's years. That's right. We all kind of have our own little thing, and I feel so like I need to find my thing. Uh, well, my thing. me too. <laughs> oh, please, we can work together um, and do a strategic planning session so, to determine yeah. this. And you know how what I'm do hoping. we? Because yeah. every time we have those yeah. things that come up and great articles that come out, but to have our administration chasing those kind of things, it would be best if we could look at them and say, where does this fall within our strategic initiatives, the work right. that we did to identify those strategic initiatives. And Tom is absolutely right. You know, we need to be student-centered. Students are why we're here. Student learning is why we're here. Um, however we 
that I would say, Tom, and go back and read that information and we'll talk about it again, is probably the one thing that we did not follow the research on after multiple, multiple, multiple meetings related to start times and the, the cost. I, I thought about asking Jade and, and Beth, she may have left, which is probably good, to identify what the cost would be for us to change our start times. And we, you know, I don't know that we could do it without having one bus route, one time period, because it, some of the issues that came up about the younger students getting home first, the elementary students, because if they start first, then they're gonna get home first. And that is a big issue to address, and we have to, the safety and security of our students and having latchkey students and that kind of thing was a huge issue that was raised by parents at the time that we did that study. So. But take a look at that. I those. will. I apologize. That's okay. Just take a look at that material. So then, Jeff, do you what? Any comments this evening? Uh, I'm going to talk about the surveys. Are you like, what are you trying to look for? If say I'm graduating this year and I graduate, I'm going to take the survey. What's the survey actually going to be on? Just questioning because I have something to add to that. I don't know. Uh, if it, like. I can think of something, but I um, there's all kinds of generic questions you can ask, but go ahead. Um, each year, I believe, during a homeroom, which is like this specific time, like like the second week of each month, but I believe once every year that I've been in the Holman School District, uh, we take a survey and how the high school's doing, and I don't know if that is what you're looking for. I but, see it. Okay, but I believe every student takes the survey and then you know the other thing once we find out what kind of details you're looking for we do do a post-graduation intentions um, that's required by the state as to what are your intentions like is it four year is it military is it a two-year and every student answers that question we have data on that so I guess it's just it's trying to determine what data will be most useful for us as we move forward in determining and planning what we want to focus on um, and, and build for the students as to what their needs are. So, well, how prepared are they for adult life? Right. I mean, that's huge. Yeah. How so that was a question that was on the survey that Bob talked about. That after I think it was taken a year after they graduated or into their into their mm -hmm. first year. But Jeff is right. There is a survey that's taken not only by students but by parents mm -hmm. and staff and and. Mm -hmm and uh, stakeholders so that also ha and we've received copies of that information on that I think it's a uh, is it an environmental or something we call it survey so anything else Jeff uh, I don't know just a little thing on surveys like today during lunch the lunch uh, ladies had a survey and I think <laughs> I was like one of the four students that actually took the survey <laughs> so, <laughs> Okay, that's just well, a funny thank you thing. For the survey. Yeah. <laughs> um, what did you write on the survey? What? Did you? Wh what kind of feedback did you give? Did you give good, good feedback? feedback? Yeah. It was like, yeah, yes or no questions, like very good, strong, and okay. whatever. But yeah, Which just something. And then uh, Mr. Holman did pretty good this year, and it's always fun to watch. But I was stuck home writing an essay, so I couldn't watch it. But I've heard great things from it. So, that's about it. Thank Can you that. explain to the public what Mr. Holman does for the school district? Like, why is there a Mr. Holman? Because it's uh, kind of cool. Mr. Holman gives an opportunity for students to raise money for a charity of their choice. And it's males, preferably, because it's Mr. Holman. But <laughs> <laughs> what they do is they... Um, they have like their own like pageant and they do a talent. It can either be funny or uh, creative or good, I guess. I don't know. But yeah. Great. All right. Thank you. Um, Kate Mayer. Um, this just kind of goes with American Education Week coming up. Um, thanks to not just teachers, but support staff and our administration, uh, transportation. I always, I'm going to leave somebody out. Secretaries. Um, lunch people help me here who am I forgetting about just all of the staff yes custodians buildings and grounds 
Yes. Thank you all so much. Um, I'm listening to you, Chris, talk about the grants that our teachers received. And unless you've done a grant, I don't know that people know. <laughs> It's a bear to produce a grant, you know, and to get it chosen, you have to have the right information and the right words, and there's a special way to do it. So thank you to people who have done that. Um, Patrice, I'm going to go back to your car because you could have given that to click and clack, and you didn't. So, yeah, that was a note I had this afternoon. I'm like, yeah, I know they're not on anymore, but you gave it to us. I really think that's cool. Um, also, Chris, just um, an aside, and, and just briefly I'll mention things for the public. There's a lot of legislation going on out there. Some has been passed, some hasn't, but I appreciate you sharing that with us. Um, WASB does a really good job of that on their site, but I think you make it more concise. And so it's a very cool thing um, from things like mandatory to mandate the CPR training. Uh, there's a trans transgender bill being looked at now that will impact us. School start date will impact us. Um, reporting crime, um, parent opting out of testing, and then I, this is just totally my opinion, but one of the most important things um, is to urge the public to keep an eye on what happens with um, Senate Bill 355, which is the referenda. Um, Kind of, um, restrictions that we have not had in the past before that include if a renda, referendum fails, we couldn't bring it up again for two years. That's pretty big. There are some other um, monetary um, restrictions that are being talked about in our assembly and our Senate, and that will really impact this district. And so I do appreciate you shooting that stuff out. Like I said, I like to read it, but I like your concise <laughs> summary of that. Um, that's it. Thank you, Kate. Lisa Collins. I don't have anything to add. Okay, thank you, Lisa. I think the only thing I would just say that we had the compensation model meeting um, and that is moving along. We uh, had some good conversation about that. I know that there is an upcoming um, seminar related to that that we're going to try to have a group um, with Dr. Mueller and myself and um, a representative from the HEA that are going to be attending that. And it was interesting because as we had that discussion, we were talking about you know, the model that we're looking at is primarily for our educators, um, but we should also should be broader and think about the, the larger groups um, as a whole and what what are the expectations for folks to um, be eligible to be moving up and moving along and, and getting raises and those kinds of things and so it was a good conversation that we had the other night personnel and governance is this week um, so we will be looking at items um, I think that have come before you before um, looking on the agenda the uh, board meeting schedule November 23rd, December 14th, and then the December 28th meeting. We have checked with administration, um, and I think we are good to not have a meeting that evening unless you are all co feel compelled that we need to meet. I um, think Gary's pretty sad about that. I think we left it up to the business office, and you know, if there was something compelling, um, but we certainly, if a bill needed to be paid that wasn't handled on the 14th, would understand if they would move forward with that. Anything significant is already probably on their radar by the 14th, so um, we will not meet on December 28th. Okay. And then um, the education convention is January 20th to the 22nd in Milwaukee. Sure. Um, yes? I may add, because I have to start registering those of you who would like to attend, um, I would appreciate if you could let me know if you are interested. Yes, if you are intending to go, please let her know, and you will get folks registered and get hotel rooms and all of those good things. Um, election notice, we have the candidates that are up for election. I should look at my other part here. Who is up? Is it Tim and Lisa? Lisa. Tim and Lisa are up for election, re-election. Um, so that process usually begins December, I think, with the
completion of the paperwork, thank you, mm -hmm. and um, filing sometime in early January. And then base, uh, board policies and rules for review. Currently, the SALT has high school graduation. Um, anything major changed on that, or is it just a routine review of? I'll see. Yeah. You? No major changes? Oh. Oh. oh, sorry, with the high school graduation requirement, it's going to be the civics test requirement. Oh, That's right. Yeah. Yes. Just thought we'd throw that out there. Yes. <laughs> Want another one of those mandates? Yes. <laughs> so anything statutorily, we may have to review and, ac yeah. and accept and approve. So um, then board meeting reflection. Good meeting this evening. Thank you all for your attention. And I would entertain a motion to adjourn. I would so move. I'll Is second. there a second? Lisa, second. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Motion carries. Thank you. We are adjourned.